Hello and welcome. We're Sisters in Crime Australia and we've been celebrating women's crime writing since 1991. Welcome to Murder Mondays, where we invite a crime author to talk about her crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore. I'm a journalist. I'm a debut crime writer. I'm a convener with Sisters in Crime Australia. Before I introduce Candace Fox, we begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Candace Fox's first two novels both won Ned Kelly Awards. Her next three novels were shortlisted for both the Kellys and our very own Sisters in Crime David Awards. In 2015, Candace began collaborating with international crime writer James Patterson and they have co-written six novels together. She is also a number one bestseller in the US and the UK and her books have been published in 15 languages. Born and bred in Western Sydney, she had a stint in the military before turning her hand to teaching and then crime writing. Welcome, Candice. Hello, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Before we get to questions, can you please give us your elevator pitch for your latest novel? Okay, sure. Uh, so Gathering Dark is the story of four very unconventional uh, women getting together to solve a crime. Three of them are ex-cons and one of them is a, um, a police officer who's on the way out with the LAPD. Her relationship with them is not going great at the moment. So you have Blair Harbour. Um, Blair was accused um, of shooting her neighbour dead. She was living in Brentwood, um, having the perfect life as, you know, um, child doctor to the stars. Um, when uh, she, um, you know, violently murdered her neighbour. Um, her, yeah. <laughs> her ex-cellmate, um, a woman named uh, Emily Lawler, comes to her and says, you know, my daughter is missing, the police won't help, will you help? Um, but Blair's trying to live, you know, a straight life. She's, she's trying to get back to that good person that she was and she doesn't really want to get involved, but she, she will for a friend. Um, the two of them recruit Ada Maverick, who is one of LA's most dangerous women um, and a crime lord. Uh, you know, she has henchmen. She's a lot of fun. She likes burying people in the desert up to their necks, things like that. And, um, and then Jessica Sanchez, um, who's having a, a difficulty with the LAPD since she inherited a $7 million mansion um, from the father of uh, a victim in a case she worked uh, so it's it's a it's a wild tale of four amazing women who really shouldn't be working together, um, and <laughs> it's not a smooth ride for them, uh, which is what I love to write. Yeah, and, and we love to read that too. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I'll shuffle the cards, and we'll see where they land. And okay, what have we got? I'm ready. When and how do you work out your plot twists and red herrings? Oh, you know, the thing I think about uh, twists and red herrings is they're best if they're not planned. So um, sometimes I'll plan a novel. Like when I when I write my ones with JP, um, we plan the entire novel all the way out, you know, chapter by chapter, the whole thing, and we'll insert red herrings and that kind of thing. Um, but I find that for my own novels, the best, the best red herrings is, you know, is you're just in a situation and the characters are talking it out and they have a theory and you go, well, that's an interesting theory. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's follow that one. Um, and, uh, you know, there are things, uh, about real life crime. Um, you know, you'll be reading a true crime case and it's like just bizarre, bizarre stuff happens. Yeah. And sometimes red herring doesn't have to go anywhere it doesn't have to mean anything it's just a weird a weird occurrence that takes you on a little fun detour um, yeah. yeah sometimes okay. i do it before sometimes I do it at the time okay hmm. who are your literary inspirations um oh there are so many <laughs> I, I read a lot uh, of wonderful crime writers from your, your very big, um, you know, your Lee Child and your 
um, Michael Connolly. And uh, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of Anne Rice, which probably affects my writing. My writing can be very sort of gothic and vampy at times, particularly my first series, the Bennett Archer series, had a lot of vampiric leftovers from Anne. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah, I mean, I can't get enough of good Aussie crime at the moment. Like um, Emma, Emma Biskic is very good. Uh, you know, Solari Gentle, people like that. I mean, there's just so much. And it's coming out. You don't have to have a huge break before you get some, some good Aussie crime at the moment, which is awesome. So, yeah. yeah, we're really lucky, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. How much of a profile do you do for each character before you write? Look, I don't do character profiles. Um, I think it's just good. I mean, for me, I just put a character in a situation and see how they react. Like in my Crimson Lake series, for example, I expected Amanda Farrell to, you know, to sort of be very good with children when, when she comes to meeting uh, Ted's daughter, Lillian, because Amanda is very childlike in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I was just in the situation and I thought, what if, you know, what if it went the other way? What if it went the unexpected way? And that's, that's what I'm constantly doing with my writing is I'm thinking what is expected right now and what is unexpected? And I just, you know, I just let Amanda go the other way. Like she doesn't like children. She finds them disgusting. And it, it's so fit with her character. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and oh, I just think characters have to be a little bit mysterious to you as well as the author author because if you know everything about them you know before you've spent any time with them on the bench it can be a little bit like I don't know for me it's just a little bit boring I know this guy I know every inch of his being I know exactly what color his eyes are and I know what his favorite milkshake is and I don't want to spend any time exploring him in scenes because I already know that you know so yeah great too. <laughs> yeah fabulous uh what research did you do for your latest novel? Well, I lived in LA, um, not in particular, you know, for this novel. Um, it's just I lived there uh, for a year just because my husband and I wanted to spend some time away before we, you know, settled down and had babies and yes. did all that jazz we've done <laughs> since. <Yeah. laughs> so um, we picked LA because we love it and I just found it so crimey and awesome uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, I just thought, I need to write about this place. And that's, that's what I do in my life to inspire me about the novels that I write. I think I just need to write about that because I'm interested in it. I want to explore it on the page. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I was influenced in writing one of the characters by um, a serial killer that I met Lawrence Bittaker. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote to Lawrence and, and visited him in St. Quentin and the experience of going to death row and meeting someone so incredibly self-involved and psychopathic and, you know, just it, it, that influenced the character because I thought I have to write about that. I have to see that. Yeah. I have to take that further. Um, so I, I suppose the theme that I'm going with in these answers is not a planned theme but it seems to be like I need a bit of curiosity yeah working it out as I go along I, don't, I think if you do too much research and too much planning and too much profiling up front then you don't you know it's the unwinding that you do as a writer that the character that the reader comes along with you, you know? yeah yeah lovely yeah uh, how many drafts do you write before handing it in um I'll write I'll write the whole thing um, and, uh, you know, just start to finish. And I'm, you know, I, when I sit down to write every day, I go back and I edit the last scene. So the whole thing gets edited once as it goes along. Um, and then I'll read the whole, the whole novel and edit it like on, you know, so on paper. Um, and then I'll hand it in at that point. But that's a bit cheeky because, um, you know, I have publishers <laughs> and I, I have contracts and if I hand it in and it's a bit scrappy, I can just say to them, Hey, it's a bit scrappy, but you'll get the gist. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like get published. Um, so probably yeah. I would put a couple more into it if I was trying to get published. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You've got to give the editors something to do. <laughs> 
I'll be pleased to hear that. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, actually, this is an interesting one now. Do you start with the plot or the character or something else? I guess you could say the plot because, um, you know, I have to have that crime that really compels me. It's, it's wonderful to have, you know, characters who are very intriguing, but if they've got nothing to do or they don't have a problem, um, then, you know, the, the whole thing sags. Um, and that's, that's what I always say to aspiring authors as I've read so, so much work of aspiring authors. And um, the thing I end up saying to them all the time is, what's the problem? There's no problem, you know, and that problem has to be there from line one. So in Gathering Dark, the first line is, you know, that Blair is is there in the petrol station and uh, she looks up and um, a girl has got a gun in her face. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> and you immediately think as the writer, like, I, I want to see how that turns out, you know. Um, but... I read so much work and it's a guy and he's getting up in the morning and he's going downstairs and he's having breakfast and he's talking to his wife and he's leaving for work and all this and I'm like, where's the, where's the problem? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? You know, and it, it, you need it to be immediate, um, particularly if you're trying to get published, you know, because you have to compel that, that, that reader who is going to decide whether they publish you or not. And you don't have five or six or seven or eight pages to do that. You have to get them hooked from line one. Um, so sometimes, yeah, that's the crime that that first chapter has the crime in it. And, uh, and, and so I've got to, I've got to go with the plot before I decide who is going to be investigating it. And then I just usually think who is not suited to investigate that. And I, I get that person to investigate it. <laughs> um, oh, how do you decide the scene of a crime? Oh, well, <laughs> I like it to be very ordinary, you know what I mean? Um, uh, because the more um, a reader relates to it um, and the more unsettling it is, I think, you know. I mean, not a lot of people hang out in, in, in scary back alleys and in, you know, warehouses in the middle of the night and stuff like that. It's more terrifying if it's like, you know, in a parking lot outside a Westfield or something and you think this is this is somewhere I go every day. This is a crime that could happen to me, um, you know. So a lot of my crimes have been sort of... I think the most terrifying is like a kid snatched off the side of the road or, or whatever. That's the crime that really makes me go, oh, God, you know, <laughs> like it's so ordinary. Um, so that's what I, I try to do. I try to make it real world. Yeah, no, very scary. Mm. What's the hardest part about writing a novel? <sighs> um, they're so long. <laughs> You have to have, it's, for me, it's like how much is enough and how much is too much type of thing. Like it's, it's <clears throat> you'll go for 80, 90,000 words or if you're a debut, you'll go for like 70,000 words. And you think I have to have enough to fill 70,000 words with the whole situation, the investigation and the character and the character's personal life and a little bit of romantic intrigue maybe and I've got to have atmosphere and setting and, and you think that's a lot of stuff but then, you know, 33,000 words into it, you go, oh, God, have I got enough stuff? I need to add more stuff, you know. Um, so it's probably that. It's probably that. Um, the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Making sure you don't have too much, though. You know, at the moment I have a novel that I'm writing and there are many, many, um, you know, there are multiple personalities in it who are viewing this event and I wonder if there's too much going on. People say to me, um, you know, my agent a couple of times, for Crimson Lake, she said to me, is there too much going on? I was like, no, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> you know, pack it really tightly, nicely, neatly. Yeah. Yeah. What is your writing routine? Or do you even have one? I have a child now, so I don't, <laughs> I don't have a writing routine. I've never been someone who really has a writing routine. You know, I grew up in a really crazy household. A lot of people know that. My mum had, you know, 12 kids at a time, sometimes with foster kids and things coming in and out of the house. 
and um, you know, and then I was in the military, and then I was, you know, working different weird jobs. I worked in a tattoo shop. I taught kids to swim club. You know, if there's a job, I've probably done it. You know, so I've always had to fit my writing in wherever and whenever I could. And I was on book tour in Germany. I remember, and my publicist who was travelling around Germany said to me. Um, all right, the train is coming in 23 minutes. Um, so we will sit here at this cafe and then we will wait for it to come. And I said, okay, great. And I opened my laptop and I started writing. And, you know, for 17 or 23 minutes or something, I went, okay. And then I shut it and she was like, I don't know how you do that. Like, how do you do just, just 17 minutes and how are you ready to go as soon as you open a laptop? And I'm like, that's, that's how you end up doing three novels a year is because you just – do it whenever you know um so i'm very lucky in that way yeah um, my brain works yeah uh, how do you write about sex <laughs> i love these questions it's so good um i never have usually before because i've always thought to myself i don't like reading about sex uh, like <laughs> Especially when someone uses the anatomical, like when someone says penis or skin or labia or something, I always go, oh, I don't say labia. Like, I don't know, but I don't want someone to say love tunnel or, or, or meat sword or anything either. So I, I get a bit awkward about it, which is so funny. But, of course, in Gathering Dark, there is very gratuitous, sex so um i suppose i just sort of pushed through from not doing it all to doing it um you know <laughs> some of the most loyal and expressive fans of mine are my brothers so i was a bit like i'm shutting off that part of my mind that thinks i'm going to read this and i'm just going to go for it but i did not use any anatomical words <laughs> <laughs> no family allowed to read. <laughs> this is a sealed section. <laughs> um, who's your favourite crime fiction character? Oh, man. This is hard. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. I mean, oh, uh, look, I'm a, I'm a huge Jack Reacher fan. I like yeah. Jack Reacher just because he's so consistent. And, yeah. when it, you know, it's like McDonald's or something, you think. <laughs> always going to be the same it's always going to be good and and there's a there's a wonder in that um and, but in in other ways i like characters who grow and learn and change like um i've always been a big john connolly fan and his charlie parker has gone on a very yeah. long journey learning who he is and grieving and becoming steadily more supernatural and things like that um so yeah probably those two yeah uh, who should play? Oh, who should play your central character on the screen? This is hard for me because um, a bit uh, tricky. <laughs> well, I just think anyone. Uh, can I skip out of this question and just you say, can have a pass? Yeah, I'm passionate about it for me. Yeah. But, well, because there's casting and stuff going on for some yeah. of my works at the moment, so I don't I say, "Oh, I really like this person to do yeah. it." And, That's you know, right. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> sure. What's the best way to dig yourself out of a bad plot hole? Kill someone. <laughs> Not like a real person. Um, yeah, kill a character or, you know, I always, like if I, if I find something is not working in my novel, I reverse up. Like I will delete 10,000 words and throw it, you know. Um, but not a lot of people are game to do that, you know, because that might be a hard one. Yeah. I have done things like um, swap someone's gender just because that seemed to unlock something, even though gender shouldn't really matter to a, a character's essence, I think, in a novel. Um, I have, you know, I, I try to do something radical and then just see if it works. So I choose something or swap something or take someone out, put someone in. You know, I've added characters to try and beef up plot points and things like that. You've got to, you've got to be radical. You can't change someone's eye colour from meridian sapphire blue to, you know, <laughs> Princess Diana engagement ring blue. Um, that won't work. 
How important is place in your writing? That's very important, I think. Uh, and I learned that writing my first four novels that were not published because I set them, you know, in New York and Paris because I felt like that's where the intriguing stuff was. And I didn't know I'd never been <laughs> to New York or Paris. Um, so I think that not not only is place important for the, the themes in the novel, like, for example, in Gathering Dark, you know, Los Angeles is just full of wild, unexpected stuff. And and that's what, you know, that's what the novel is about. It's about things that don't belong, you know, because I'm there in LA and, and we're driving along, um, for example, and this woman um, popped out into this intersection, this homeless woman, and she was swinging two hammers like this. Ah, you get away, you know, talking to people that weren't there. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> we should call 911. And we did. Um, and they were not amused with us because they were like, if you think that that's the most dangerous thing that's happening in LA right now, you're obviously tourists, um, you know, but like, I just love that about LA. You just never know what's going to happen, who's going to pop up next. And, and that's what I'm trying, what I was trying to do with the novel. It's all this unexpected stuff just pops up and it's all in a big hectic mess together. And that's, that's so place is really important really important for that kind of thing okay we're on to the last one candace oh all right yeah <laughs> how would you get away with murder oh it's hard yeah it's really that's a hard one i've always said that um the best crime scene is the wild you know um like a in the investigators of the Ivan Milat um murders had yeah. such a problem with their crime scene because it was so vast and you know, once it rains, everything's ruined and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and whenever you throw someone in moving water, I think that's always great for getting <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, it's things like how do you, because once you've had the person in your car, mm. that's it. <laughs> They've yeah. been in your car. DNA's in your car. It's really hard. It's really hard to commit the perfect murder. Um, so it would have to be a stranger in the bush that you encounter near a river. <laughs> <laughs> Fishermen beware, Candace is coming. That's for right. You. All you bushwalkers, watch out for Candace Fox. Candace, thank you for sharing your time with us on Murder Mondays. Thank you so much. This has been way fun. Thank you.